inverse powers of some higher than scale, right? So you can think of A as one over some UV scale. So the error you're making in the computer can be described as a set of operators which are all irrelevant. So as you take the continuum limit, and you take this UV to infinity, so you've, this scale going to infinity is the same as A going to zero, all these corrections vanish. And you can get even a little more formal, and you can parameterize this entire discussion in an effective field theory framework. This goes under the name of the semantic expansion. And you find there's corrections at scale, not just with A, but with alpha strong as well. But you can really formulate this whole thing in the language of effective field theory. What I mean by that is effective field theory is a way to say you have included all relevant physics. The only point is there's some coefficients who you don't know a priori. You have to somehow compute those coefficients. But the point is it captures all the physics and you can systematically control that so you have to do the calculation at several values of A so that you can control these contributions and extrapolate them away. But by construction, the entire theory is gauge invariant. And we want that, because otherwise, if you didn't have a gauge invariant construction, if you are unlucky, or maybe almost all the time, for example, your, your gluon will become massive, right? Because gauge invariance is what protects the gluon from receiving a mass. And if you add a mass to the gluon, you're going to completely change the dynamics of the theory if that mass happens to be uh, you know, big or Can um, we just use the Minkowski uh, space plus the Euclidean space in our discussion? Why not just use Minkowski space? Yeah. Okay, the problem is if you start in Minkowski space, your, your path integral Let me just go a little step further and say we've already discretized the theory state. So it's a finite set of numbers. So this is a wildly oscillating integral, right? So how do you decide which sets of A to keep? If you could come up with an algorithm to do this in Minkowski space, you might get a Nobel Prize. This is a really hard problem, and lots of people would really be happy. So think about it and late at night in bed, but don't face your career on trying to solve that problem. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason we go to Euclidean space, this is Minkowski, you have the same thing, except now it's a Euclidean integral, and you get e to the minus sum over x. And so now, as you pick values of the gauge field that make this large, these become unimportant, right? Because you basically what you have is e to the minus s glue. This, this being s glue. And so if, if s glue is much greater than zero, this doesn't contribute at all. But uh, if your set of s G are all approximately equal to the classical action. So this, by definition, is equal to the minimum. Right? This is the absolute smallest value of S you can have. 
And so if you find a set of G's that are close to this classical one, those will be the most important, they'll be the largest contribution to this integral. And so because this is a this is a real number, you can use Monte Carlo to have a probability interpretation. So the fact that it's a real number lets you use this stochastic approximation technique to determine the important G's to use. And that's the heart of it all. And so this, for example, is why you can't use finite chemical potential. If you add a finite fermion chemical potential, this action becomes complex. And suddenly you don't know how to evaluate the most important action, contributions to the action. Uh, the physics, the way you extract the physics is different. Right? The same physics is in the theory. Under certain assumptions you can't prove, you can perform a wick rotation from Minkowski to Euclidean space. Yeah, but the boundary conditions jump in. We don't know the boundary. The boundary conditions? Yeah, the boundary so we're, we're always going to find, so I didn't mention it, but we always define, not always, the absolute most convenient way to define last QCs is periodic boundary conditions. So you take your fields A mu of uh, A and L equals A mu of zero. For example, periodic boundary conditions, the reason this choice is optimal as it preserves translation invariance, so you get momentum conservation. But when we do a weak rotation, we do have to see the boundary should be zero. And then that, and that kind of one is the, the integral, the infinite part is zero. But that, that not always be true. No, all you need is if there's no poles in between the rotation. So the only, the only thing you need is all the poles of your theory live like this. You don't need the, the boundary condition is infinite. You need the boundary conditions to throw away partial derivatives, like when you integrate by parts. But the wick rotation just needs the poles to be in the right location. This is the part you can't prove in a non perturbative theory, that the poles only exist like this. Sorry, yeah, okay, right, right. You're saying you need the infinite contour contribution for right. edge. Uh, what do we do? What do we do? Uh, he's worried about um, the fact that you're going to find a volume. How do you guarantee the boundary conditions allow for the width rotation? Because you don't actually approximate the fields of infinitely large distance where you can show the advantage. Yeah, maybe that's it. So the point is, uh, also in the language of effective field theory, you can include the corrections from a finite volume, the fact that you have a finite volume. And what you can do is take the Euclidean, well, okay. That's a practical answer. So formally, you just have to let the volume go to infinity before you can show the two theories are equivalent. And then in practice, in a finite volume, what you can do is you can encode the volume corrections in chiral perturbation theory, which is dominated by the pion. It's the lightest degree of freedom, so the pion extrapolates to the edge of the box. If you have a systematic way to control that effect, you can remove it from the calculation. But you still, what you never actually wick rotate back to Minkowski space. What you do is you always, you have to extract all the information from Euclidean space time. So you actually have to be very careful and figure out 
what pieces of information are exactly the same in Euclidean Minkowski space. So I'll talk a little bit actually about that tomorrow. So the short answer is you can calculate the spectrum. That's no problem. If you want to calculate two particles interacting, that's actually, you can't directly do that. You have to use tricks to figure out how to do that. So you, you can't do scattering processes in the Euclidean space time directly.